several months has been working with the three guys that are been speaking this uh, Sunday. The first hour, Nathan Toomey. Second hour, Bob Rasmus and Tim. Come, give us God's word that you've give, you've been studying. I'm excited to have you here. Thanks. Take care. Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Tim Coulterman. I've been attending GBC on and off for the last 30 years. Um, I grew up here at GBC with my mom and my dad and my three sisters. Um, I met my wife Sandy when I was at UConn, and we've been married for 16 years. Um, as you can see from the photo up on the screen, we have four children. Uh, Evan, he's our 14-year-old. He'll be starting high school at Ledgerd High in a few weeks. Um, Haley, she'll be 12 in a few weeks, and she'll be starting seventh grade this year. <coughs> Rachel, she's our third, she's seven years old, and she'll be starting second grade. And then finally, Hannah's our baby, she will be four and be starting kindergarten. Sandy and I live with our family here locally in Gells Ferry, and it's a pleasure for me to uh, give the word this morning. So today we're going to be continuing um, the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to be looking in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 34. And the title of our message today is, Our Heart, God's Greatest Treasure. This morning we are looking at Matthew chapter 6, which is a continuation of our Lord's Sermon on the Mount. In this part of the sermon, uh, Jesus is teaching his disciples and the crowds about what it means to be a true believer in God. Jesus talked about having uh, the proper attitude when he went through the Beatitudes or the attitudes that ought to be. Um, he praised those who were humble and showed mercy he blessed those who loved justice and sought after righteousness and had a pure heart. And then he went, off, went on and continued past the Beatitudes and talked about issues like being salt and light and letting our good deeds shine for the world to see. He emphasized the importance of the law and that he had come to be a fulfillment of the law. He addressed moral issues like hatred, murder, lust, adultery, keeping your vows, loving your enemies, giving to the needy, proper worship and prayer. But now we come to the section of the Sermon on the Mount in which Jesus deals with how we handle our material possessions and worrying about the future. At first glance, they may seem like two separate issues that are independent of each other, but as we look a little deeper, as we look a little deeper at both of them, we will see how they come together to influence both issues. Let's read through our passage. Matthew chapter 6 verses 19 through 34. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. It is not, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, Will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. As we look at this passage the entire, and the entire Sermon on the Mount, I think it is important to remember who Jesus is talking to, who is his audience. 
Well, I believe that it's clear that the first group of people that Jesus is talking to is his inner core of believers. That would be his disciples, the 12. Most likely they were the ones sitting closest to him, listening to his sermon and being taught. The second group were the seekers, uh, or what I like to call the seekers. These were the common everyday folk who were fascinated by Jesus' words and were hungry for more truth, but had not yet committed to being one of his followers. The third group, which I thought would, were probably in the crowd, and you know, based on other sections in the scripture, we see these folks when Jesus feeds the 5,000. But I like to call these the opportunists. These are the people who loved Jesus for his miracles and hung around to see if he would do more, especially to satisfy their physical needs. But they were not interested in what he had to say. And the final group is similar to the third, but a little bit more malicious in their, uh, in their, uh, in their uh, desires, were the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. And these were the religious leaders of the day who always seemed to camp out near Jesus and were always looking for an opportunity to catch him misspeaking or confront him in a controversial teaching or maybe even accuse him of blasphemy. They did not do this out of a sacrificial concern for the people who they were supposed to be shepherding. Rather, they were self-righteous hypocrites who feared Jesus' popularity and power and were desperate to put it to a stop. So as we consider who Jesus is talking to in this section, I think Jesus had two main objectives for his sermon. First was to teach the disciples and those who were truly seeking him how to love God and live according to his law. The second objective was to confront the religious leaders, the Pharisees and teachers of the law, on their false religion and hypocrisy. Many times Jesus would use moments like these to confront the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. And in, and in this instance, I believe he brilliantly weaves these two principles uh, into his teaching. The Pharisees were more concerned with the accumulation of material possessions, power, and outward expression of faith. However, they neglected the more important issues of the heart, which is what Jesus seemed to focus on in the Sermon on the Mount. They were, cons they were more concerned with the external than the internal. That is why they were, more they were more concerned with the external sins of murder, adultery, and divorce, and seemed to pay no attention to the secret sins of the heart like hatred, lust, and, fidel and infidelity. All of these are background issues that leads into Jesus' discussion on money and the security it brings for the future. So in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 34, Jesus addresses two major issues that seems to confront every person. And the first, stockpiling possessions, and the second, worrying about the future. In the first part of the passage, Jesus addresses the, stocking, the stockpiling of possessions, and he does this by making a simple but direct statement to his followers. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. It's a very simple statement, but it's curious. Why does Jesus make this statement? And who is he talking to? Who in the crowds were stockpiling money and material possessions? Well, in a general sense, I think he was talking to the whole crowd because everyone's guilty of putting material things ahead of God. But again, we see Jesus' words are directly directed at the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And how do, we, how do we know this? Well, if we look at other passages in the gospel, we can get a glimpse into the mindset of the religious leaders of the day. And quickly, and we'll look in Luke chapter 16, verses 13 through 34. And this is a parable of the shrewd manager. And this is basically Jesus making a commentary, uh, very similar as a parallel passage in, uh, as far as the one that we read here earlier. But I'll pick it up where it says, where Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And this was obviously a radical statement because the Pharisees say in verse 14, or it says the Pharisees uh, who love money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. So obviously the Pharisees in their heart were more concerned about stockpiling treasures on earth. So what is the issue with stockpiling possessions? Well, Jesus says in the passage that earthly things like money, food, clothing are temporary. They only last a short while and then they're gone. They are susceptible to things like rust or they fall apart or get eaten by animals or taken by thieves. In those times, wealth, were, wealth was gathered in three main forms, gold or other precious metals, 
clothing and food. And that's why Jesus puts those examples in his statement. By making the statement about possessions, Jesus is trying to shift our focus from the physical to the spiritual. Instead of focusing on what you can see and touch, Jesus challenges us to value things that will last for eternity, which are our treasures in heaven. So is it wrong for us to have possessions? Is God condemning us for having nice things? In Matthew 19, verses 21 through 22, we read about a rich young ruler. And in this passage, the rich, run, the rich young ruler asked Jesus what he needs to do to enter the kingdom of heaven. And this is Jesus speaking. This is after the rich young ruler asked the questions about how he can enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Well, it would seem from this passage that Jesus wants us to go and sell all of our possessions. But is that really what Jesus is asking us to do? Can we apply this request that Jesus made to the rich young man to ourselves? Have you ever noticed that this was the only person in the Bible that Jesus ever told to sell everything he had? He never told Peter or John or Paul or even Matthew, the tax collector, to sell everything he had. He never asked rich men like Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea to do this. Did God ever ask Abraham or Solomon, two of the most wealthiest men in the Old Testament, to do this? Well, I think you know that the answer to this is no. Then why the rich young ruler and why everything that he had? The reason why I believe that Jesus told the rich young ruler to go and sell everything that he had was because that everything he had stood between him and God. It wasn't the amount of the possessions the young ruler had or, or what the possessions were. It was the fact that the treasures got in the way of him loving God, and God wants our hearts and not our money. Let's look at another example in 1 Kings chapter 3, 10 through 13. And in this passage, uh, King Solomon is praying to God and asking for wisdom. And the Lord responds to King Solomon by saying, in verse 10, the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this, that being wisdom. So God said to him, since you have asked for this and not for a long life for wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment and administering justice, I will do what I have asked. I, I'm sorry, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never be, I'm sorry, that there will never have ever been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. Again, God is not against us, not against granting us wealth or prosperity, but he is more interested in our hearts as illustrated by young King Solomon, who first sought after God. And God wasn't afraid to give King Solomon wealth because his heart was right before God. So as we come back to the passage here, we should ask ourselves, what are treasures in heaven? And how do we store up for ourselves treasures in heaven? Obviously, these treasures aren't physical. So what is Jesus talking about? Well, if we look back to what Jesus said earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, we can get an idea of what these treasures might be. So if we remember back to what we had uh, heard earlier in the summer, we remember that Jesus taught us to love our enemies to give to, the, give to the Lord in secret, suffer persecution for Jesus' sake, be a peacemaker, hunger and thirst for justice, be merciful, and seek after righteousness. I believe that all these things, although they're not physical things, um, in the most, for the most part, they're not physical things that you can do or have or possess, but these are things that God will recognize as being treasures that will last for eternity in heaven. And some other examples, some practical examples that you can do today are spending time with your family, helping a neighbor in need, teaching a Sunday school class, or even helping out with VBS. Maybe it might be being a faithful witness for Christ at school or in your workplace. It could even be giving monetarily to the church or even supporting a missionary abroad. And there are more examples I could give. 
But the one thing that is unique to all these heavenly treasures is that they pay eternal dividends in heaven. The impact that you can have on a friend, a neighbor, a coworker, or a stranger on the street just by loving them, meeting their needs, or even spending quality time with them can impact them in ways that you may never know. But God knows. God sees what is done in secret and rewards. Just recently, we had VBS here at Groton Bible Chapel, and I thought about the kids that were here last week, uh, the other week, and I would venture to say that there are many kids who came to VBS who had never been at church before, let alone heard about Jesus. But we had so many faithful men and women here at Groton Bible Chapel who poured their heart and soul into these kids, and many were saved, but there were probably just as many kids where just a seed was planted, and who knows what kind of treasure in heaven will come from this. This is the kind of treasure that God seeks. So now that we know the difference between earthly treasure and heavenly treasures, can we stockpile both kinds of treasure or is it one or the other? Let's look back at the passage quickly in Matthew 6, 24. It says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Well, it seems clear that Jesus is saying that we cannot serve money and God equally. And when, it, when this passage talks about money, I think money includes just about anything that is material. It could be actual money, possessions, houses, cars, 401ks, or anything that's earthly. Jesus is saying in this passage that there's only one thing that can be number one in your heart, and you have to choose. Either God will be number one or something else will be. And if you choose something other than God to be number one, then you've replaced God with an idol. And an idol can be anything you value in your heart. It can be your bank account, your house, your career, your retirement savings, or anything that you treasure more than God. What did Jesus say in this section? He said, where your treasure is, there, will your, heart, there your heart will be also. And God wants your heart, not your earthly treasure. So the question you and I need to ask ourselves is what do we spend our times thinking about the most? Who or what is number one in our lives? This is a very revealing question because it's a question that only you can answer. It's a private matter of the heart. And Jesus is most concerned with our heart. Just like when he addressed the crowd about murder and adultery, he cared more about the underlying issues of hatred and lust because both those sins originate in the heart. So how do we keep our hearts from focusing on the wrong kind of treasure? Well, let's look in verse 22. We read, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? What does it mean when it says, if our eyes are healthy? I think what Jesus is saying is that our eyes are the gateway to our heart. Everything that we can perceive or know is first filtered through our eyes. If we allow our eyes to focus on e things that are evil, like coveting after material possessions or lusting after things that are not ours, then our hearts will be polluted with the same kind of evil. Job understood this when he said in verses, uh, Job 31, 1, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. Job, who was a righteous man, knew how important it was not to allow his eyes to be corrupted. So is it really only a matter of just controlling your eyes? The truth is our eyes do not act independently. They act on the desires of our heart. And I think that's what Jesus was talking about in this section. So what needs fixing, our heart or our eyes? Well, I think the answer is both. However, if we're going to focus on the right kind of treasure, then we need to, trans then we need to transform our hearts. Only God can fix our hearts. And in Ezekiel 36, 20, 24 through 26, we read about God doing this exact thing for the nation of Israel. This passage is God prophesying, prophesying about the nation of Israel returning to him. So in verses 24 through 26, we read, For I will gather you up from the nations and bring you home again to your land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. Your filth will be washed away and you will no longer worship idols. And I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. And I will take away your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. God is in the business of healing broken hearts. God can take a stubborn heart of stone and make it soft and responsive to the things that please him. 
And Jesus will do the same thing for you if you call upon his name and ask him for a new heart. Just as he did for Israel, he will save you and cause you to seek after him. It is this kind of, tra- this kind of heart transformation that will lead you to trust him for the everyday necessities of life, which brings us to the last section of scripture. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and your body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Well, in this final section, Jesus is making an emphatic statement that God is in control of everything. So don't worry. In fact, worrying about things you can't control is fruitless and will not add a single hour to your life. He compares worrying about the future to how the pagans or the unbelievers act. It shows a lack of faith and trust. But isn't that true that as frail, sinful humans, we are all prone to doubt God's provision for us? So what is at the root of our doubt and worry? Well, I believe the answer is trust. I think deep down we don't trust him. Why don't we trust him? I believe the reason we as Christians don't trust him the way that we should is because we don't spend enough time with him. I guess the question becomes, how can you trust someone that you don't know? The answer, is, the answer to that is we need to spend more time with him, more time with him in prayer. So the question becomes, how are our prayer lives? We need to spend more time with him in the word. Are we making time for devotionals? And lastly, we need to spend more time with him in worship. Are we glorifying God with what we do and say? The formula is simple. The more you know him, the more you'll love him. And the more you love him, the more you'll trust him. Trust is something that I struggle with constantly, and I'm sure you guys do as well. Just quickly, um, as I was preparing for this sermon, I was thinking about trust and um, I thought about when I was a young lieutenant down at Fort Benning. Um, I attended a school called Airborne School. And uh, Airborne School is where you learn how to jump out of airplanes with all your combat gear. And as a young lieutenant, I had to trust those who I didn't know, the sergeants who would teach us at the school, the pilot who flew the plane, and the guy who packed the chute. In fact, I never even met the guy who packed my chute. <laughs> So it's interesting. I thought it was an interesting contrast because I was willing to put my life in their hands even though I had barely known them and I hadn't spent much time with them, but I was willing to, to trust them with my lives. And I thought it was kind of ironic that a lot of times we don't trust God just for the little things in life. You know, what we're going to eat or how we're going to pay the rent or, or the car or just worrying about our health. But yet we're sometimes we find ourselves trusting in sinful men rather than trusting in the God of the universe. So what does Jesus tell us to do in the face of uncertainty? Well, he says to seek first after his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. But what does that really mean practically? How do we seek God first? Well, part of seeking God first starts with us being obedient to his word, It includes praying to him and thanking him for what he has already provided and trusting him for the things that he will provide in the future. It means giving to those in need without fanfare or ceremony. Seeking after God means telling others about Jesus and being being a faithful witness to our friends and coworkers. And simply put, seeking after God, seeking after his kingdom and righteousness means to love God above all else and to love others as you would love yourself. And we see that theme throughout the gospels. In fact, in Mark 12, 26 through 28, we read about a conversation Jesus has with one of the teachers of the law. 
And in this section, we kind of pick it up in the middle of it, but it's about the, the teacher of the law who's asking Jesus uh, what the greatest commandment was. And one of the scribes came over and heard them arguing and recognized that he had answered them well and asked him, what commandment is the foremost of all? Jesus answered, the foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The scribe said to him, Right, teacher, you have truly stated that he is one, and there is no one else besides him. And to love him with all your heart and with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love one's neighbor as himself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. God has made it easy for us to seek after him and to know him as Lord and Savior. He doesn't require elaborate ceremonies or rituals, or long meaningless prayers, or a system of laws and requirements to know him like the Pharisees had constructed. What God requires is a heart that is contrite and repentant, that cries out to him for for forgiveness, a heart that seeks him first and trusts him for righteousness sake, a heart that loves God above all else. And if this is something that you desire for yourself, a heart that knows God and seeks after him, please see me or one of the elders or even the person who brought you here today, and we can lead you to him. So returning to the passage, if we seek first his kingdom and righteousness, then God's promise to us is that he will provide for our needs. In fact, Jesus gives us even more assurance by reminding us that God cares for all of his creation. Jesus makes a comparison that if God loves and cares for the most insignificant things of his creation, like flowers of the field and birds of the air, then of course he'll provide for us. What Jesus is asking us to do is to trust him, even in times of uncertainty or when things don't make sense. Because if you truly love someone, you will trust them. Love and trust are uniquely connected. But notice when Jesus gave the example of the birds of the air, that the birds weren't just sitting around waiting for the worms to be dropped in their mouths. They were busy doing what God innately put in them to do which is to stay busy and forage for food. And I believe in the same way God has put in each one of us skills and abilities that should be used to glorify him. We shouldn't take his promise of provision as a license to be lazy or unproductive, but to do the things that God God has called each of us to do. So before we start to worry about tomorrow or or for the basic needs in life, what does God ask us to do? Well, he asks us to love and trust him, to seek after him, and and to do the work that he has called us to do. As we conclude today, let's consider three takeaways from the passage. First, let's remember to store up treasure that lasts for eternity by loving God first above all. Remember, the kind of treasure we have indicates who and what we love. Second, our hearts can only serve one master, and that master should be Jesus. He is the one that we should love and trust. And lastly, we should trust the one we love. If we love Jesus and trust him for everything, then we won't worry about tomorrow. If God's greatest treasure is our heart, then we should be investing all of our treasure with him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this passage on uh, storing up treasure in heaven. Lord, help us to be convicted and to seek after you and to do the things that you've called us to do. Help us to focus on things that that are eternal and not things that are temporary. And help us to remember to trust you even in times of uncertainty. And so, Lord, we thank you so much for all that you've given us here. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.